All right, so next up we've got Thomas Barr from NBC Universal, who's the chief architect there, and he's gonna talk about building next generation audience targeting and analytics. Can you hear me? Is it working? Good. All right. So, as mentioned, I'm Tom Barr. I'm from NBC Universal. I am part of our advanced advertising group. Okay, so we are responsible for those dreadful ads you see on TV and everything else. But our industry, just like a lot of industries, are facing some severe challenges in this environment, right? The competition for your attention has never been greater, right? We have cat videos, which is, you know, we were talking about in DCOS days, we we're making fun of it, but, you know, when you think about all of the self, you know, user-generated content that's out there, the YouTube, everything else that's vying for your attention, you know, it's no longer an age where the family comes home, has dinner together, sits down and watches TV at night, right? We all consume our content in different ways, which creates unique challenges to us, but also creates tremendous opportunity, right? And so the advanced advertising group at NBC has been set up to take advantage of that, to not look at it as, you know, TV is yesterday's media, is to take that original content that we have excelled at for so long and then to allow it to be, you know, viewed across all of the different distribution channels in different ways and to be able to monetize that and take advantage of that. And so we were asked to stand up a cutting edge platform to house all those data assets and allow us to do that, and we've, you know, I'm gonna discuss with you how, first of all, some of the business challenges, a little bit more detail, and then go into what we do with DCOS. So, would it surprise you today that, you know, we sell essentially advertising on TV the same way today as we did 50 years ago, right? We sell 70% of our advertising upfront. It's not data-driven. If you ever saw the show Mad Men, it's very similar to that. And yes, there is a lot of alcohol involved, right? And, you know, we literally, there's no data analytics driving behind this, or very little, right? A chief marketing officer will come up during our upfronts, which kick off in this big event in New York, all the, well, everybody does this, right? And they'll just sit there and literally sometimes they'll say, well, you know, my kids watch The Voice. Let me buy The Voice, right? Okay, we'll sell you The Voice. Doesn't mean that they're necessarily getting to the audience that they want, right? But we'll sell them The, the Voice. What's worse is we sell it one, one selling title at a time, right? We don't really know, we have intuitive feeling, but we kind of sell it by one selling title at a time. It's the same thing that's been done for 50 years. And when you think about that, right? I was thinking about this on the plane ride here this week. Entire industries have, have started from nothing, become raging hot, and now have disappeared off the planet in those 50 years that we have essentially done the same thing, right? Blockbuster came to mind. I was thinking about that, right? Started up gangbusters once when we started putting videos on VHS. It was the darling of Wall Street for so long, and now it's gone. Yet TV has persevered, right? This year, we'll do about $10 billion in linear TV, okay? And so it's a very good business. But we face the challenges that I described. And so how do we take advantage of that, right? So what we wanna do is find, follow, and engage our consumers in a personalized way to, to navigate this monumental shift. Okay. So that just went nuts. 
Oh, I see. This is animation. Hmm. Silly me. They were in in viewing mode, didn't I? By the way, you can tell by, and, and there's, a, there's a prize, not really, because he'll ask me for it. <laughs> but at a certain point in this presentation, you're going to see where I go out of the marketing slides and then go into the engineering slides. It's really obvious. I'll clue you in. All right? But most people don't know. You know, I mean, we're familiar with NBC and some of our shows. But when you look at all of the distribution channels that we have, our content providers, our partnerships, you know, we're called NBC Universal because we have Universal Parks, we have Universal the movie theaters, right? We have all of the networks you see up there. This gives us a huge amount of reach. And every one of these um, issue, you know, distribution channels, networks that you see are backed up with applications and websites that all generate content. And we're not really taking adva full advantage of that content because of how we're structured, you know, all of our brands are individual and they operate fairly independently. So part of, the part of our challenge is to gather all that data, create a 360 degree view of our consumers so that we can then target our, uh, you know, provide additional benefits and additional lift for our advertisers to target audiences. So how big is our reach, right? There's a fact. NBC Universal reaches 268 million people every month. Now it probably surprises everybody, and that's across that whole portfolio. It would surprise you to know that that's 35 million more than YouTube and 25 million more than Facebook. And that's not taking into account they kind of have a problem counting these days, in case you haven't heard, right? They've been counting a lot of bots, not just Russian bots. So, you know, we still reach a tremendous footprint, right? And this is all original content. It's quality content. It's content that our advertisers want to be associated with, right? So how do we monetize that? So as I mentioned, our portfolio, right, it includes 95% of the U.S. population, right? Uh, we have the expansion of OTT and app deployments, which is increasing our interaction, right? One thing I want to ask here and make this somewhat interactive and at least somewhat entertaining, right? How many of you are cord cutters, right? Don't have a cable subscription, right? Yeah, we don't like you. No, I'm just kidding, right? You still are consuming our content. You're just doing it in ways that you choose to. But it's hard for us to measure that, as weird as that sounds, right? We're still measuring TV, linear TV, the same way we did, guess what, 50 years ago, right? It's based on about, what is it, 40,000 households? 30,000 households, right, on a panel, and then we go across all the distribution providers. That gives us the ratings. Um, let's see what else we have here. Uh, we have parks. So we have millions of annual visitors to our parks, both here in California and in Florida, right? We have transaction services through Golf Now and Fandango. Yes, we do have Fandango as part of our portfolio, all right? And uh, we have growing engagements with fil films, DVD sales, and much more, games, you name it. These all have interactions with consumers. They're all generating data. We have to gather all that data into one central place, create that 360 degree view, and then give increased value to our advertisers. So Audience Studio was set up about two years ago to do exactly that. Right? I was brought on about a year and a half ago to, and, and by this gentleman right here. And I was asked, you know, hey, listen, we have to build a state-of-the-art data asset analytical engine that can allow us to target, build these targets, and then apply them to any of our distribution means. This means 
apply them to linear TV, right, so that we can generate an optimized media plan that's based on data, that's not based on somebody's kids watching a show. So, you know, and if our advertisers want to come to us with their own data, great. We'll plug that in, we'll build the audience based on that data, we'll extend the audience, and then we'll target that, right? And our whole thing is to do it at scale, guaranteed. Doesn't matter how we're going to see that consumer. It doesn't matter where we're going to see that consumer. So if, we, if it's on our app because the person's a cord cutter, fine. We'll target them, we'll count them, we'll do all of them. So this is what we like to call our ice cream slide. It looks like an ice cream cone. But there are three aspects to this, right? There is our national linear TV, which is what you're mostly familiar with. I define that as you watch the TV for the most part when we want you to, right? That's linear TV. Now, there are aspects to that where it's time shifted or VOD, you're still going to see the same advertisements, right? But for the most part, linear TV is defined as you're going to watch the show when we want you to, right? Then there's addressable TV. This is after a certain amount of time, you go to your box, you watch VOD, you watch your OTT apps, right? But now we can target you with custom advertising based on what you, uh, what are your interests, what we know about you. And by the way, in a, you know, autonomized way, so don't get, you know, don't worry about privacy. We, trust me, I have to worry about that every day. Right? And then we have our digital aspects, right? We, uh, and as you look, still vast amounts, right? On a scale, there's 105 plus million t US television households. There's 19 million addressable households because not every cable box has the ability to be addressable, right? And then we have 172 million uniques per month on our desktop and mobile applications. We're putting our money where our mouth is. So this year we announced, Linda Vaccarino, who's the head of all of ad sales for NBC Universal, announced and said, and this is pretty um, uh, unique within the industry, because this is still, this whole data analytics driving sales is still fairly new in the industry. There's, there's some players that are doing it, but we're kind of, we believe we're taking a leadership position here. And so out of that $10 billion, we allocated $1 billion of that for programmatic or uh, data-based advertising. So one-tenth of our entire sales this year, uh, and we're well on track to do that and achieve that goal, right? So it's taking the trade, and you know, in, in Ad Week, it actually says it's taking the training wheels off of Audience Studio. So now, we no longer are the, the little toy that was kind of nice and we have to do it at scale, right? We can't just do it and paper it along. So we have some technology goals, right? We got to unlock and utilize the data. You would think it was a lot easier. We spend about uh, a, you know, a couple of days here every other month just talking to our brands that are here Try going down to Florida, trying to get the data, get the data all together. Everybody's individual cost centers and you know profit centers, so this is not an easy task, right? Um, we have to take ownership of our linear optimization solution. Uh, we have to be nimble, right? This was part of the challenge when I came here was we didn't really know what was needed. This hasn't been done before, so it's build us a platform that can take anything and do anything, right? And so, you know, and you can see throughout all of your discussions today that, these, you know, in the last two days, if you were here for DCOS days, DCOS lends itself to those kind of dynamic, nimble, we don't know what we're, you know, what, what the challenges of tomorrow are gonna be, right? Uh, let you read the rest of that. We have several this year of technology goals. So, what's our value proposition? We're targeting at scale. 
We'll utilize our advertiser's data. We'll utilize our data. We'll combine them. We'll do it in a privacy safe manner, in a manner that's fully tenant, so that we're not gonna intermix advertising data, right? Right, we're gonna get better cost efficiency. So, you know, in the example I started with, where somebody came in and said, I'm gonna buy the voice prime time because my kids like it, right? Well, what if I can go ahead and save them money and get them the same audience across some of our cable properties? And you say, well, why would you want to do that? Well, that'll free up that ad slot, right, for somebody else. And then we move that off of there and still get them the audience. So there's, there's a win-win for everybody. They're saving money. They're still reaching their audience. We're freeing up the slot. Maybe we can monetize it for more, right? There's somebody who needs it because the voice happens to hit that demographic really well for them, all right? And then inventory insights, right? Again, this is exactly what I was talking about. Shifting across all of our portfolio from some of our hot portfolios, right? So, anybody notice the change in the production quality? Right, these are my, now uh, I always say that you don't hire me for my PowerPoint. The so, slides are not brought to you in living color. Uh, they, they are absolutely not. You're, 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 you're good. <laughs> I like that. So essentially what we're talking about is building a data lake, right? And because this is, this is kind of loose how, you know, requirements we have. We have a whole bunch of data from a whole bunch of different sources. We've got to bring it all together. We've got to analyze it, figure out what we're going to do with it, create a target, send it out, right? How do you do that? But those were the, essentially the requirements we have, and to this day, to, to a certain degree, what the requirements we have. So we wanted to go ahead and build a data lake. And as I was looking at it, little, little stuff, right? I, I looked at it and I was, you know, I wanted to go in the cloud. I didn't want to be on-prem because of some of the challenges that can be there with some of the, you know, as I have experience with on-premises data, uh, data lakes, they, they almost, you know, they have difficulties, I won't use the term fail, by their mere success. Because if you're on-prem, you have limited resources, right? They're, they're limited, right? You know, it doesn't matter, at some point, you're running out of spindles. And so if you, you create this data lake and everybody jumps on it, you quickly have these unbounded resources because you're usually successful, um, you know, requirements, and you have these very bounded resources. So along comes the cloud, right? The cloud solves the problem. Well, you can't do it cost effectively, because if all I do is shift my Hadoop cluster, let's be honest, that's what we're talking about here, at least on-prem, HDFS, and I move it into the cloud, there's a tipping point in cost, right? We can debate on what that is, 200 tera, 300 tera, but eventually it's too expensive, right? And so I was always thinking about this, and this is not earth shattering, but this was a shift we made about a year ago. I kind of thought about it and I said, well, you know, the problem really isn't the cloud, right? The problem is that we're taking HDFS and a Hadoop infrastructure and moving it into the cloud, which is really where the cost is, right? Those, those volumes, those spinning volumes are expensive. Right, and that's what costs you money. So we quickly shifted over to a S3, as you can tell, we're in an Amazon cloud, but all the major providers have an object store. And we just basically shifted over to running Parquet files on S3. It's a cost-effective storage solution for us. And it's led me to believe, and Greg over here asked me to drop the bomb, I view honestly, with all due respect to, the, to our Hadoop fans, as Hadoop is yesterday's technology. Right? As quickly as it came all the rage, when I have a DCOS cluster running Spark at scale, I can go against an S3-backed, right, Parquet-based system, which is infinitely scalable, never runs out. I can do it as a cost-effective way. And if we're truly honest with ourselves and look at the cost of ownership on-prem, which is in terms of all the people that are there that maintain it, the DevOps, 
the amount of discs that have to be re replaced, the support contracts, we're pretty much on par in cost, you know, from the back of the envelope uh, analysis I've done. Quite honestly, I don't want to have to do that. I'd rather let the, prov the cloud provider worry about that, right? Same thing with, you know, DCOS we'll get into. I, I have so many challenges within the business, I don't want to worry about infrastructure. I don't want to worry about, you know, those, those spinning volumes. I don't want to have to have DevOps. I want my engineers, as many as I can, concentrating on solving this problem because, quite honestly, we have a big challenge ahead of us, right? You know, we, we got... We, like everybody else, we got Google and Facebook staring us in the face, right? So that's how we solve the problem. Now, there's also other advantages, right? One of the things that I, I, I want to go into here is that there's a couple of things within all data solutions and data lakes. I can't stand copies of data, right? Everybody in an enterprise, especially at NBC, copies data. And they bring it into their own little toolbox. And they do it for a lot of reasons. Number one, they can't get the data at the right form, you know, they can't get the data at scale in the way they need it. So they take a copy and they move it, right? And then they do their own transform. That's horrible. Number two, how many of you have ever seen within your data lakes where it's like the Roach Motel? Data goes in, but it never comes out. Right? And I contend old data is worse than no data. Right? So, you know, we can set an expiration date on S3 and it just goes away. Right? And unless you're really savvy with a Hadoop cluster, how much of us have really implemented multi tendency and, you know, user permissions? It's really at the, I got access to the cluster and now I can see everything. Well, within S3 or any object store, I can control, based on policy, who sees what file at an atomic level. I can control it by the directory. I have all that permissioning stuff. It's all built in. And I don't have to do anything other than create the policies. Right? So I get a lot of advantages here. So, like everything else, even though I've been spending a lot of time with an audience studio talking about uh, parquet files in S3, we do have to have other data stores in our lake, right? We do use Amazon Redshift. That's our only cloud locking technology, and I contend that it's not. It's nothing more than a Postgres database with a colander based data engine, right? I can get that out of Vertica, right, if I want to pay for it. I can get that anywhere. It just was cost effective to do it, right? And I needed that enterprise data warehouse to put a GUI in front of right, for my ops teams. Uh, run Postgres. Run Postgres because I still have, re, you know, relational needs. Those things don't go away, guys, right? If I'm going to build REST services, I'm going to have access control, I'm going to have these things, there's still, we have to relate objects together. So you utilize what's best for it. So Postgres exists in our stuff. And yes, we use Cassandra. We use Cassandra to go ahead and link in our data, digital data aspects so that we actually can do the targeting for the digital layer. All right, uh, next slide. We got time. So part of what I also wanted to do when I built out this platform was I wanted to do and service all of the aspects of the big data for the enterprise, all right? From custom UI solutions, which is what our operations teams do, right? This is typically what we all do. We build our REST services. We put a UI in front of it, right? And then we give it to our ops teams, right? And then all the way up at the top are engineers and like myself and our data scientists who want to attack the big data at scale, right? And generate the code, generate the algorithms, generate the ETLs, right? And so the complexity goes up and your, your, your amount of model data, right? At the top, I'm dealing with the atomic level. What I wanted to do was build out an infrastructure that would allow everybody within the sphere here interacting with the atomic data, right? 
And by the way, I don't care how you do it. I'm going to offer you certain what tools you use. Because one of the things that, that I, led me to believe, you know, to believe that a lot of the data copying happens is because they all have their favorite tools. At NBC Universal, we have a tremendous amount of data analysts, okay, and data scientists, sort of, okay, that are providing huge value to our customers. They're doing custom reports, they're doing analytics, they're doing stuff for our customers, they're interacting with our clients, okay? And guess what? They're not engineers, right? Because first of all, we're engineers. We shouldn't talk to clients. Second of all, you don't want to pay somebody like me to do that. There's no need to it. So these people have different, they have non-engineering degrees, and they have tool sets that they're used to, SQL being one of them, right? MicroStrategies, Tableau. These things are not open source, and I know they may be bad words around here, but this is the reality of the enterprise. These people are providing critical roles that we constantly ignore, but they still have to do their job, so they copy the data. Right? So I wanted to open this all up and allow them through the power of DCOS and Spark to attack that data right, at scale. Or if they don't want to use that, if they have their own, since I'm on S3, let them go ahead. If they want to run a snowflake, don't know why. Fine, spin it up. I'll give you your keys. Have at it. <coughs> Just utilize the data that's in the lake. If you want to augment it, write it back out. Somebody else will use it. So how do we do some of this within DCOS? Right? That's my little data pool. Right? So raw data comes in. Every data that comes into Audience Studio comes into S3. Right? It's, it lands into our data lake. The first thing it does is our DCOS cluster through our ETL processes, kicked off by Kronos and stuff, pick it up and immediately transform it into a parquet file, which is an exact match of the input data. This way, I don't want to hear, oh, I need to get at the, the original data. No, nobody needs to do that kind of string processing, right? I mean, CSV is CSV, for the love of God, right? We can all just deal with parquet files. Right? Get a much more efficient view of it. If you need to, we can talk. Right? And then we're going to start linking the data together. And we're going to start pulling all of the aspects of that stuff so that we can get that 360 degree view of the consumer I talked about earlier. And we link all that data. And all of those intermediate steps are also written out to S3 and made available to the enterprise to attack. Right? And so then, as I mentioned, I honestly, if you want, I'll give you access, my, you being the enterprise, to the S3 Parquet file so you can use whatever you want. You want to spin up your own stuff in the cloud? Go have at it. But I'm also going to go ahead. I'm going to offer you data as a service with a REST API. I'm going to offer you audience products. And I'm also going to offer you a SQL interface through a uh, Spark thrift server that uh, we contributed to the uh, community <coughs> that you see here. I'm doing okay. So, you know, one of the things that we do, this our analytic tool sets, we utilize Zeppelin notebooks tremendously, all right? It's, 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 it is truly a very powerful tool. But the thing that surprised me the most about Zeppelin Right? I don't know how many of you have used it, but you, you, you're shaking your head, right? It's a very powerful tool. And so people, engineers like myself, some of my data scientists, not all of them, very comfortable with it. I'm like sitting there going, but wait a minute, three lines of code, I'll give you the three lines of code. You can now attack it with a SQL interface. More importantly, I can do in-memory outer joins. God darn it, how cool is that? And when we go back to that slide about the enterprise, that may be cool, but I discovered that although I consider it simple, it's not simple for people without engineering degrees, right? So that was a real shocker because I really thought through notebooks, 
we had the whole solution solved, but we don't. So we go ahead and we go ahead and we give you a gateway, a, C, uh, a, a thrift server, a Spark thrift server through DCOS. And now all of a sudden, I don't care what BI tool you have, if it talks SQL, plug it in. And now what we've done with this is we've opened up the power of Spark, right? That kind of big data analytical capability or querying to the entire enterprise just through that simple enabling technology, right? And even some of our people like using SQL editors like dBeaver, right? I don't care. They can have at it, right? And then we have our Spark cluster, right? It's, it's truly been good for the enterprise. You know, it's, it's, you know I, one of my colleagues today said, well, you know, a lot of the data gets copied because it's just inherent. Everybody wants their own copy. And my answer to that was, well, there are certain things I can't do, but I can eliminate the excuses, right? So if, you know, one of the main ones is I have to copy the data because I, I don't want, I want to use my tool set. Ah, I just eliminated that, right? So now, lastly, DCOS. Greg is finally sitting there going, oh, God, he's finally talking about it, right? We run everything on this cluster. Right? From our management, our CI, right? Our log management through Elk, everything, right? Our compute side, Spark, Zeppelin, Play, Kafka, right? Up until they called me and they said, hey, we want to talk to you because you're running our SMAC thing. I, with the exception of the A, we're running SMAC. And I was like, oh, we are? I didn't know. It just seemed logical, right? I think all of us, a lot of us came to this conclusion before they named it. It was just natural within the power of the engine here. And then we have our data stores where S3 sits off to the side. Now, interesting, for the first time, and this is one of my last slides, and then you guys can happily go for your booth crawl and your drinks, you finally see the dirty little word Hadoop, right? And you just heard me go on for the last 30 minutes about how I don't run Hadoop. I run a very small Hadoop aspect onto my cluster, and why is that? Well, I need to get my Spark history. I could write my Spark history to S3. Problem with that is it doesn't give it to me interactively. It only writes it at the end of the job, right? So I do need to run a little bit of a Hadoop cluster within DCOS. And, you know, when I was initially talking to some folks at Mesosphere, they were like, yeah, that's kind of why we originally put it in there. And then it kind of grew from there, right? So that's why we do that. Uh, and then we have Cassandra. Uh, we're not really using a lot of HBase at this point. So I kind of went through this reasonably fast, landed the plane in time so you don't get upset with me. Do I have any questions? And did you stay awake? Hopefully you stayed awake. Go ahead. Hi, my name is Scott Fulton. I'm uh, with the uh, technology world equivalent of NBC News, their uh, publisher called the News Stack. Oh, yeah, they wanted me to know if I wanted to talk to you. Yeah. And I didn't get back. Well, we can talk. We can talk. Uh, I asked this gentleman. We can talk. We, in, in our publication, we talk a lot about something called microservices. Mm -hmm. And people who talk to me about microservices say that when, when an organization or an institution adopts microservices, including when they're doing big data like tech projects, it changes the corporate culture. It makes your institution into a microservice bearing institution. It changes your concept of service oriented architecture. And I'm wondering if anything you've talked about that you've accomplished with Audience Studio thus far has changed the culture of the network that's been selling uh, ads pretty much the same way in spot to it, 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 I, I don't, I, you know, it's interesting. I've never really associated it with the microservices piece because uh, we're fairly new to NBC, we being the Audience Studio engineering team. And so we're a bunch of digital advertising veterans, so we've kind of been doing this kind of technology for a while. It's just new to TV. Um, but absolutely, in terms of bottom line sales, when we commit $1 billion, one-tenth of our linear sales to being data-driven and hence microservices-driven, yeah, it's had a direct effect on the bottom line. Okay, so yeah, absolutely, right? So you know? in the bottom line, meaning on, on, on the revenue, 
on the revenue and, and how we do, and necessarily how we do things, right? I mean, this is a big change for us on how we sell advertising. I, I kind of glossed over on it, but you know, it's, it's, it's hard for an organization when you have that much top line revenue. And you know, we increased ad sales this year 9%. That's been in the paper, so I can say that. Okay, I have to be careful sometimes. And, and it's very easy to rest on our laurels, right? We're kind of leading the front of this because we see the tsunami coming at us. And if we don't change how we're doing business, right? Instead of that 10 turning into 20, right? It's gonna turn into eight. And that's not good, right? I really enjoy working for this company. So yeah, it has revolutionized how we do business. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Excuse me? Okay, we're, we're at about a, we're just starting out, so we're at about a hundred tera or so. Uh, we process data both in uh, real time, so all of our OTT and digital assets come at us in real time, and then add into that audience graph, all right? And then a large part of just the nature of linear TV is its batch. So we get a lot of stuff that comes in batch at night. And that's really also, by the way, where utilizing technology like DCOS really allows us to save money and get some cost effectiveness, right? Because the very nature of what the cluster does changes so much from our nighttime overnight batch processing. You know, the, the, the real time kind of goes along kind of constant state. It has its ebbs and flows as, you know, people are awake, right? But you know, the nature of the, of the same stack changes. At night, it's running these huge ETL processes, stitching all the data together that ran together, viewership data, you know, when you watch something on your cable box, eventually I'll see it, right? If, I'm, if it's part of for some of the providers we deal with, by the way, in a totally autonomized way, so I, sir, I will not know that you're watching whatever you're watching, okay? But, it comes, into the, it comes into the cluster at night, and then during the day, our data scientists, our data analysts are attacking the data, providing value to our clients, so it changes much more into an analytical mode. And I don't have to have several clusters to do this. I have one, right? So I hope that answers your question. Any other questions? Oh, uh, yeah. Oh yeah, that's that's the guaranteed part. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we have it. We have this bad word in the industry. It's called a make good. That's when we. That's when our optimizer, okay, and our and our forecaster goes oops, and we have to make good. It's okay if we over deliver the audience, but if we don't, un, if we under deliver the audience, then we have to make good on that. We don't like doing that. So yeah, we do have after uh, pacing reports and everything else that are made available to the clients, right? Anything else? Well, then I do believe it's time for booth crawl and drinks. Thank you so much.